you. Thanks for tapping into another episode of Untapped Keg podcast, where we explore different perspectives of sobriety, mental health, so that you can take something, implement it into your own life. Here, we believe there's only one right way to sobriety. That's the way that works for you. I'm your host, RJ Zimmerman, and I'm excited to be joined by a sobriety coach for gay men addicted to crystal meth, Dallas Bragg. How are you doing today, Dallas? I'm doing very well today. I'm doing great. I'm learning a lot about um, organizing my time this week because I'm moving. Nice. Saturday, but I decided to keep all my appointments and keep my everything running the same way as if I wasn't moving. <laughs> <laughs> So I have this time th- time blocks throughout my day. Pack this, pack that. So I'm really dialing in. How is the time blocks working for you? Because I use that that technique as well. Actually, yeah, it's the answer to my. I, mean, I, I hate to say I have ADD or ADHD because everybody says that. Um, mm-hmm. Every addict has that to some degree, um, but I do. There's a there is an an innate pull for me to not focus on what I'm supposed to be doing. (laughs) Um, Even though like I love writing, but for some reason, when it's time to write, I want to find my phone and, or take a walk or, you know, I'll do all these other things, but the time blocks are perfect because I know in this hour, this is exactly what I'm doing. So I turn everything off, turn the phone off. I turn on some black brown music or whatever um, and just do that and force myself through it. Um, so, so actually, honestly, it's great because all day long, I know exactly where I'm supposed to be every hour. I mean, I've scheduled Mm -hmm. the night before the next day. I schedule myself for every hour, nap time, (laughs) lunch, (laughs) everything, walk, you know, I have it all scheduled out. And so, because it just keeps me really on task because I will take a nap when I feel like taking a nap or I will do the laundry, you know, because I'm working from home Um, or I'll take a walk with the sky's nice or whatever. And so this keeps me. On task, I get so much more done. And that's that's the that's the hack, right? And setting yourself up for success and fi- figuring out what works for you and what necessarily doesn't. And yeah. that's it's finding those things. And so yeah, time blocking works for me for a lot of the same reasons. And it's something that um it helps me to divide my day, especially with like you're talking about appointments and uh, clients coming in and scheduling. And it's like, okay, I'll set aside, you know, I'll be able to move it here, be able to time block in between a little bit. And so sometimes when you don't do that, you have that hour in between. It's like, what do I do with this hour? I don't really have enough time to do something, you know, big, but if you have that time block, you're like, you're taking that decision away and setting yourself up to get stuff done. Right. (laughs) Yeah. The book, uh, Atomic Habits really helped me out a lot with understanding how to incorporate new things. Habit stacking. Yeah. Oh, yes. That yeah. is so big, especially yeah. with ADHD. Like habit stacking yeah. is, I, I swear, it's the only way that I brush my teeth at night. It's the yeah. only way. If I don't <laughs> habit stack at night, I'm not brushing my teeth. It's not, yeah. not going to yeah. happen. I know. Yeah. My 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 thing was the, the kitchen. You know, I would get so stressed of my kitchen being dirty. And I have a son that lives with me who doesn't seem to click with that. Um, so anyway, every morning while the coffee's brewing, I clean the kitchen. So I have that yeah. amount of time. <laughs> and I nice. always have a clean kitchen every single day because I make coffee every single day. <laughs> Coffee's first that, priority for me. So Absolutely. Yeah. That is refreshing to hear. That's something that, you know, I might take and try it out and see how it works for me because <laughs> I got a six and a four year old and uh, working through how to clean up after themselves. Yeah. It's a little bit of a struggle. I mean, as it is with six and a four year old, it's not like, you know, I'm expecting the world from them, which is nice, but it still involves a lot of cleaning for dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my son's 20. So <laughs> he's still a kid. He, he does. There's I things. Know, it's that, easy. You know, yeah. There's things that he does and yeah. is, and doesn't mind but there's something about setting the dish into the dishwasher that just i I stopped fighting it just you know it's too it's too you have to choose your battles and i stopped fighting that one and said i'm just going to have it stack and get it done (laughs) i like that i like that that'll that'll be really great for when we get into the theme but uh dallas for people who may not know you could you give us a little bit of a background of yourself 
Sure. Sure. Um, so uh, I was married to a woman uh, for 12 years. We had two kids. Um, I grew up in a very strict Pentecostal background um, in West Virginia. So I had a mother who was Pentecostal and a father who was a heathen. Uh, and I was a confused gay boy in the only gay in the county, <laughs> pretty much. And so I didn't know where I belonged, didn't fit in anywhere. Um, and so, but I was just so scared because I, I, I kind of, I kind of gravitated toward my mom because my father went into the military. So he was gone a lot. Um, and so in the church, you know, I was taught that I have, was demon possessed uh, and that, you know, so I would always, I would go up to the altar and get everybody, they would lay their hands on me and they would pour oil on me and they would, you know, it was over and over and over. I was, they were trying to get the demons out of me. <laughs> um, and so finally, after I was 30, I was 36 and I was like, I don't think the demons are going anywhere. And if they aren't, I'm just going to you know, live with them. Um, uh, cause I, I just couldn't take the, the cycle of thinking it was gone. And then two weeks later living in this guilt of I'm still, I, I'm still who I am here. Uh, so I came out thinking that that was the answer to my problems and it was actually exasperating my problems because I didn't belong in the gay community either. I was even more judged. I was even more isolated and ostracized. So I turned to crystal meth. Um, it was for the first time uh, when I used, it was the first time in my life that I felt comfortable being me. Uh, totally uninhibited, totally accepted because, you know, in the gay community, crystal meth is a hypersexual drug, and um, the person I was with didn't care how I acted or how I dressed. Well, we didn't have clothes on, um, and it, there was no kind of judgment at all. And so I was like, this is finally, I finally found my place. And so I dove in deep. I had a doctorate, just finished my doctorate, was making you know way over six figures and lost all of that within two years, uh, two and a half years, I was homeless and with a criminal record. So, um, in between, of course, you know, there's a lot of, there's some stories there, but so in getting sober and building my life back with the kids, the three of us built our lives back together, actually, um, we became very close, but then after that time and experiencing treatment centers, clinicians, uh, the justice system, I, I, I witnessed that there was a huge gap of knowledge about how gay meth affects or how crystal meth affects gay men in, in this epidemic that's hiding in plain sight. So all of there was just so much missing that I thought I wanted to be a sobriety coach to fill in those gaps, not to replace therapy, not to replace treatment or anything like that. But to sit in front of another man who who knows that I completely understand what they're feeling, what they've gone through in their life, how guilt and shame has you know perpetuated this, and then how you're trapped in this sex addiction. Um, and so just that relatability, you know, it, it cuts through so much so that you can actually you know help. And so that's that's why I decided to become a sobriety coach, and that's who I specifically help and that's what i've been doing now for um about 16 months yeah so yeah that's my story <laughs> and that's something that is wow you've been through a lot and you know um for long time listeners you know i guess they know but for people who are just joining us and are kind of new i like to have somewhat of a theme to start a conversation um and it really your story leads into opening yourself to receive support. Mm -hmm. And what was it that initially opened you up to receiving support to, you know, really move through um, what you were using crystal meth and sex for? Yeah. You know, it's been a process. And one of the first times I remember understanding that I had closed myself off uh, was at the end of toward the end of my of drug treatment and um, the counselor wasn't going to let me graduate 
which I didn't exactly know that he wasn't, but we were mm -hmm. meeting. And I said to him, I was like, you know what? I'm actually scared to graduate. I'm scared to be without the rails of this program being tested. You know, I was in drug treatment court too. So they were testing me four or five times, sometimes six times a week. Uh, I saw a judge every other week, you know, and so I had a lot of guardrails um, and all of that was going to fall off. And um, I admitted to him that I was scared. And he's like, this is the first time in a year and a half that you've been honest <laughs> about where you stand um, and that you haven't had a chip on your shoulder that we don't understand gay men, <laughs> you know, because I, I also had this this, um, I, I guess, this attitude and anger toward the system, too, that you don't get it, you know. Um, but that showed me how honesty could open myself up to growth because I was honest. And it's, it was counterintuitive in my mind because I thought if I admitted that I was scared, they weren't going to let me out. But it actually showed growth. Um, and so that showed me in my sobriety that I needed to be honest with everyone, especially even my kids and say, you know, I'm triggered right now. Uh, I want to use right now, you know, which is uh, to be honest with you, even after six years, one of the reasons I've kept, I, I do my son's dishes <laughs> is that he, living with me kept me sober. And, um, it was a way for me to, to not bring in men and not have parties and, 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 you know, even, even a couple of years in, I, I don't know that I, if I was living on my own, if I wouldn't have succumbed to the, to the temptation of it. Um, <clears throat> so along the lines of emotional sobriety, which is what I, my goal is in beyond any 12 steps or beyond, you know, being living without the substance is I wanted to understand why I was still angry. Um, and, you know, I always tell my clients and because I tell myself, I know where I stand emotionally when I am driving through traffic, <laughs> because if I am screaming, if I'm on edge, if I'm trying to race around people, that is a reflection of my emotional balance and how regulated I am inside. Um, and I, I didn't understand how that was also playing out in other ways. Um, I was, I began to be angry at people when they wouldn't text me back or, you know, when I started building my business, I tried to network with other coaches and they wouldn't give me the time of day. They wouldn't, they would read my messages and not answer. Right. Um, that's just a part of business, but to me, it was total rejection. Um, and so I, I started to analyze how often all day long I was thinking angry thoughts about these people, um, and how, and how that it would just, I would ruminate and ruminate. Um, and then I started to realize when I started to think about this and, and pray about this, and analyze like why am I angry? It it came to you're not receive you're you I, and my question was why am I blocked right? Why is this angry anger blocked? Why am I my sobriety blocked? Why is my business blocked? Everything seems to be at a plateau in a in a, a wall. And the answer came to me that you aren't opening yourself to receive love. You're not opening yourself up to receive love from yourself or from other people. There are people trying to love you, but you aren't looking at them. You're only focusing on the people who aren't texting you back, <laughs> you know, and then you are also, and then I, I started to discover that when I would talk about my father, this, the, the venom that would start to come out and I had gone through so many different processes of forgiveness with him. I mean, I wrote about it. I have a very famous article about, you know, forgiving him after he died and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But I didn't realize you, you still haven't. <laughs> you, you're still harboring 
all of these emotions because you haven't let them come out. So the thing is, is that I had blocked myself from receiving because there was no room. All the room in me was unprocessed emotions, unprocessed anger, mostly. Um, and so what I had to learn to start doing was fully expressing instead of suppressing anger about how I felt, um, even in my childhood, because I'm big on not being a victim. So in thinking about my childhood and what happened to me, and the fact that my father really took away the joys of my childhood, I, I wouldn't say that because I didn't want to come across as a victim. I didn't want to be like, it's his fault that I was addicted and those kinds of things. But then it occurred to me, you haven't fully let yourself feel angry about it. It's okay to be angry about that. And, and so I started to, when those thoughts came, I started to let them fully ride. And it's like a wave. It's a wave in the ocean. For me, it comes, starts at my feet <laughs> and the emotion rises up my body like a wave and I'm trembling, I'm hot, my heart's beating because I'm fully feeling that anger and the unjust, injustice and the unfairness of what happened to me. Knowing at the same time, he was a traumatized individual. You know, it wasn't malicious. Nothing in life is personal, but it still happened. You know, so there's a difference between playing a victim and being victimized. And yes. I had to realize that and allow myself to be victimized. <laughs> I was victimized by this man's trauma and, and my mother's trauma. And the, these, these kids were, they were 17 when I was born. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and so I would fully let that come and then it would just subside. You know, and there was something about letting that come out that started to make room inside me and that room was like I started to to when I spoke about my father I would speak just like I just did it wasn't a blame and it wasn't venom and there wasn't hidden anger I was making space to love um and so I started doing that I got into it <laughs> you know I started I my anger at the church you know and what they the, what the the image that they portrayed of God and how, <clears throat> okay, motion coming up, but how they took away a, 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 an opportunity to be connected to a higher power be through this, bringing me up and trying to cast demons out of me, you know, and making me scared to sleep at night in case I died in my sleep because I knew I was going to hell, you know? And so mm. I had to, go back and feel that anger at my family. This is my family. My, my uncle was the pastor. My grandpa was the elder. My other uncle was that. I mean, it was my family making me portraying this image of God that was completely not it. Um, and so in my own sobriety, I went to an ayahuasca ceremony <laughs> And I experienced what connection and higher power and all of it happened. It all happened in a night. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is what church is supposed to feel like. <laughs> you know, love and empathy and opening up. And I just saw everyone in this different light. And um, I saw myself in everything. And I was like, this is God, you know. Um, so I had to feel that anger. And so anyway, I just went through an inventory, you know. I mean, I, I think that this something the 12 steps talks about right is some kind of inventory but um i i went through this inventory of my own emotions and what was suppressed and through it, letting them out like i said i started to make room for love um, i started to be able to receive and suddenly if someone complimented me um i would say thank you for once instead of making all the reasons why they're wrong or thinking that they probably didn't really think that you know, um, I would, I would embody it because I, for some reason I started to believe it, <laughs> you know, and then, um, I, I, then that changed kind of everything for me and how I started to, 
I saw my business begin to move. You know, um, I was receiving new clients, receiving new leads, um, receiving growth um, because suddenly I just I saw the world through a different lens um, and had opened myself up. And and really, I think that the, the core was feeling worthy to receive it. You know, Ooh, the, the yes. worthiness. Yeah, because I I, you know, I for decades didn't feel like I was worthy for anything. I didn't feel, you know, I, I just felt like trash. And, um, and so that's why I, you know, the, the, the addiction and everything that I went through and losing it all was just a proof in the universe. It was, I was just proving my beliefs about myself that I am trash. I'm trash. So I'm going to be homeless. You know, I'm going to do, I'm going to be addicted to shoplifting. You know, I, everything was just, backing up what I believed inside. Um, and so the the inverse of that is I started to believe that I am worthy. So everything in my life is beginning to line up in that way too. <laughs> so. That was so much wisdom packed into your story that there's so many things to pick out of there. Um, you know, one thing I want to talk about is that tool that you called out right away and how you notice based on how you are going through traffic. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is where my emotional state is right now. And mm -hmm. when you start to become aware of your emotions and, you know, the emotional states that you might have that are acting out subconsciously that you're not completely aware of when you can notice these things. Sometimes for me, it's how short am I with my kids? Right. Mm -hmm. It's, I do the same thing with traffic. Am I getting angry at traffic? Okay, why am I getting angry at traffic? Did I leave too late? Because that's yeah. on me, yeah. right? <laughs> and so actually getting, you know, being honest with myself about where, what power I had and what my decision led to it. And it's like, okay, yeah, this is frustrating. I can make it less frustrating by leaving five minutes earlier. I knew mm -hmm. better. I checked that last three TikToks that I did, right? Like the, the, <laughs> there's there's those things that you can work through, but when you're talking about your, I, there were so many things you said that I was just like, oh my God, that is exactly what I've gone through. Like with anger, mm -hmm. with grudges, mm -hmm. with looking yeah. back and, you know, not sitting there and in, in like in the woe is me, but also um, still holding on to that anger. And what is that anger? Yeah. And I recently, and by recently, I mean yesterday. <laughs> realized this uh block that i had internally where i was giving my power away mm. um and i didn't realize it mm. and i was again like this is where an, a, your awareness is such a double-edged sword where it can work so well in getting you to move through things and building your self-worth and growth right and healing and it can also keep you completely blocked and sucked down in this quicksand and you'll just, you know, sink deeper because you're focused on the quicksand and not the ropes that are around you. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I was thinking about my divorce and like, Oh, how could this person like choose this? How could they, you know, mm -hmm. they chose this way. And now I have to deal with those consequences. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I was listening to a podcast and I'm like, wait, I've been focused on this for, a couple months and I've, fe I've felt this block internally. Right. And I was like, mm. what did I choose in this? I mm. chose to move forward. I chose right mm. to actually file the paperwork. I chose wow. to mm. cut ties for a lot of different things. And it's like, mm. I chose that because I chose me mm. and like that, just the feeling that came from that. When I read, when I like, again, looked at, my power. What was I looking at? And it's like, shit. Okay. All right. I see that I was doing that again. So now it's, you know, identifying these things that could be the blocks and just how you're talking about too, like the energy going through you. Yeah. Uh, that happens to me. Like I got, I got two hours of sleep last night and I feel like I got eight because <laughs> that block that I removed for the energy that like every single oh, yeah. time I do that, it's like a night or two of I'm not sleeping very much. And it's not like it's terrible sleep. I don't wake up feeling like I'm not rested. I'm just 
can't sleep. It's almost like a, a manic thing, but at the same time, it doesn't get in the way of how I'm living my life and things like that. And so it's, it's really interesting. And just what, what you brought up the opening to receive, you said something that was the biggest key for me to be able to start to open to receive in recognizing that I was not actually seeing the support and the love that was geared towards me. Mm -hmm. I was seeing the things that were again, confirming what I thought about myself and confirming mm. my own self-worth and not actually seeing and able to receive that love. And so when I realized that I was trying to prove my love, I was not actually, or prove that I was worthy of that love, right? Like, you know, I wanted to prove that I was worthy of being in people's space. And all of a sudden, when I took a step back from that, and it was almost like, you know, being colorblind where you can't see the support. And then all of a sudden you just, you put those glasses on that allow you to see the colors. You can't see it. Dang, dang. That's what I'm missing. Oh, and it just opens you up so much. Yeah. What, what yeah. has been a really, um, what have you noticed has been a practice to be able to open, keep yourself open, um, for that support? Sure. <clears throat> so, you know, what you're talking about, the blocks to seeing what's in front of us and the Buddhists call it obscurations. They're, they're obscuring the light, right? which is basically trauma or limiting beliefs, you know? And so for me, um, I picked this up from A Course in Miracles, and that is, how can I see this differently? How can I see this? I'm willing to see this situation differently. And for me, as any time, so there was a time, there was a, a day when talking about back to my son, leaving things around, uh, the he had left some boxes somewhere and my reaction was so exaggerated and I kicked the boxes across the room. It was screaming and everything. And um, that's always a, a sign when, when I act in an exaggerated way from a very simple stimulus, something's there to learn. Right. And so I, you know, I, I retreated and at, I'm as, and I say, I'm willing to see this differently. And I pause and I kind of meditate on the situation. And what I figured out was it wasn't about the boxes and it wasn't about him leaving them or his laziness or anything about him. It's about me and it's about my guilt because when by seeing him be lazy, I immediately equate it to me being a bad father, me missing out on his formidable years, not just through addiction, but when I, when I came out and left them with the, my wife, ex-wife, um, I saw it all kind of downloaded to me. This is about you and the guilt that you have not processed yet. And so in that instant, that's enlightenment because you're not obscured anymore from the true cause that that obscuration of the light is moved through your perception shift and then you're enlightened because you see the reality of what's going on and that's a tool just one question is uh, or one statement i'm willing to see this differently and through that willingness that's opening yourself up to receive the guidance of god or higher power whatever you want to say i say god as a term as an overall term however you want however it lands for you <laughs> uh, so but <clears throat> for me is saying that question and being willing to be introspective self-aware that opens up me to receive guidance because otherwise i'm trying to figure it out in my mind tr trying to figure out from a place of being obscured you know, um, you have those those lenses on that only pick up your beliefs. Like you said, I believe I'm this. And so that's what I'm going to see. 
Um, and so through that question, that's been my biggest tool for opening myself up. Um, because receiving a perspective shift is what spiritual growth is all about. Perspective shifts after another is personal growth, mental growth, emotional growth, spiritual growth. It's it's only seeing a situation in a different way. The situation doesn't change. It's the meaning we place on it. And to me, that's what true like recovery is about. <laughs> yes. Is, is every day finding out. So, you know, I, I picked up uh, in my packing, I picked up a journal I was writing in 2009. And I started reading it and I was like, dear God, this could be a page out of what I wrote last week. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, I was saying I was struggling with some of the same things that long ago. Um, and so in, in what came to me, though, was it was a boss that I was talking about. And this boss was this um, very direct, um, overbearing man. And I had just been bitching about a boss the ne the day before um, in a current part-time job that I work, right? And I started to realize, okay, how can I see it? Because I first wanted to go down a spiral of, I haven't changed. Like, I think I've changed, you know? How am I dealing with this thing, you know? Um, but then I said, <laughs> I had to stop and say, I'm willing to see this differently. And what came to me was, you're triggered. You're not triggered by this man. You're triggered by your beliefs about men due to your father. And until you sort through them, you're always going to have that same boss. He's going to show up in a different person. But it's the same energy. And then I started to think about every job I've ever had and how I've ever, always had a male boss that I've had a problem with in th in th 30 years of working. And why did I never put those dots to <laughs> to together? It's because I was not opening myself. I was not open to receive. <laughs> yes. And now that I am, I see it. It's all in light. I'm enlightened. You know, mm. this is enlightenment now. That it's not all of them. It's me. How can, what am I not giving? A Course in Miracles also says, in every situation, it, you have to ask, what am I not giving in this situation, in every problem? What am I not giving? And so what I'm not giving was awareness and willingness and openness to receive it. So I, was, uh, I uh, opened myself, I saw the connection, and all of a sudden, it occurred to me also that what's triggering me in the this man is what I don't like about myself. You know, I can be very direct. I can be very rude. I can be very insensitive. And these are all things that I was saying about him. And they're all in me. And so that just broke down all, instantly any feelings I had about him. And I was like, damn, all this time I've been talking about him, spreading, you know, anger and venom about this man and all this time it was just me the whole time <laughs> and as soon as i get past this he this archetype is going to fade away out of my life <laughs> and that's what i'm excited about too so that that's Oh no. So technical difficulties, I don't know, it might be me. It looks like my internet's running. Dang it. It was such such great conversation and my god giving away the game with it was all me right and that's that's the truth that is something that when you start to understand that ooh okay Dallas is back can you hear me Dallas yeah, yeah I can hear you was that on my okay. end I 
I'm not 100% sure. Maybe, maybe it was my end. Um, you, you froze and then it went off. I don't know. Maybe it was. I don't know. Yeah. You, yeah. So you were finishing up talking about <laughs> um, the archetype fading and you're excited for that. Yeah. And that's, that's when I ended. Okay. <laughs> I, I, that, you know, I thought you it, were. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, yeah. The, you had asked about the tools that I use and right now, you know, the thing, if, if you are, if you are open to receive, if you're open to, um, asking yourself how to get better you're always going to come up with new tools those are mm -hmm. the tools i'm currently using <laughs> and that that's it's important that you say that that because i've been talking to a lot of uh groups that i work with in this naked mind and um other places sober powered community mm -hmm. and telling them the tools that you use right now may not be the tools you use mm -hmm. even a month from now i mean a year from now two years from now the tools that i used when i stopped drinking are not the same tools that I use right now because none of those tools were rooted in emotions. Mm. Like it was, it was eight years after I stopped drinking that I actually started to actually feel my emotions. Mm. And, you know, it was, it's only been the past two years, which I guess, yes, that would be at eight years, RJ way to do math, but <laughs> where I've actually started to understand what I've been feeling and what, those emotions are and being able to work through them, like you were talking about earlier, because as you start to learn what it is that you are feeling and you can work through it and you start to realize that, and this is what I was talking about um, when you came back was when you start to realize that other people, like the judgments I'm putting onto them are actually about me and what they're putting onto me is actually about them. Yeah life becomes hmm. a lot more flowy. Like yeah. there's a lot less things that you get hung up on. And that doesn't mean that every once in a while, somebody won't say something that like really gets under. And like you were talking about earlier, you know, there's, there's things that get under you that are those triggers that raise those emotions. And you don't necessarily know what it's going to be, where it's going to come from. Finding those tools to be able to work through that, whether it's in the moment or whether it's after or, you know, during, yeah, that's, that's the key to this whole healing thing. And then being able to see and open yourself to receive, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's support, whether it's love, whether it's, um, guidance, just wisdom, new perspectives, it's mm -hmm. that when you start to do that, that's when things really, um, start to get really special and, are really, really fun too. Like that's, that's the thing about this, this mm -hmm. healing and growth. Yeah. There are moments where it does kind of suck, right. Working through these things that maybe you thought that you had already worked through, or maybe they're just things that you don't want to think about again. But on the other side of that, you get to have fun. You get to experience that joy that maybe you were holding yourself back from. You get to just get, you know, reclaim your belly laugh and have a big smile. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. something that, that you get to, you get to do. Um, mm -hmm. But it really comes with feeling those emotions. And um, earlier you were talking about, especially anger, um, kind of being a, a flag, you know, and that's really what I like to call anger as well. It's, such a great moment when you, when you're angry and especially when you're angry at those little things of, Oh, I need to take a step back and just evaluate what's going on here mm -hmm. because it's not this situation. It's not what just happened. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's right. That's right. It isn't always. And you know, the, the subconscious, the ego, the subconscious doesn't, operate in linear time so it it classifies and it organizes by emotion you know so yes. when i am triggered by my boss at 47 years old i'm feeling that same emotion as i did as an eight-year-old boy and that's what i'm reacting to yeah because it's not him <laughs> it's not anything to do with him it's me and it's not me at 47, it's me as an eight-year-old. <laughs> you know, you have to really, when you begin to understand that, like you said, it's fun because you begin to really unpack and unpeel 
so much that you're allowing yourself to have fun. You're allowing yourself to be free mm. and you're healthier. I've been, I'm actually aging backwards. I feel like since all of this, because it's Same. just, there's so much light going through me and my life through this by getting able, being able to move stuff out um, that it's just, it, it's such a less burdened way of existing. Yes. Like the, the amount of stress that has come off of me since I started doing this, exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I keep, I keep telling people, I mean, I feel better now at 37 than I did at 25, like being yeah. completely honest. And yeah, <laughs> it's something I've act, I see it. Like I see it when I'm playing, you know, softball or baseball, or I see it even, you know, when I'm doing Kung Fu, things like that, the way my body is responding is not how my body would have responded at 25. And so yeah. seeing all of that and just feeling it too, it really gives you that motivation to keep going, but also gives you that understanding of um, how you want to feel physically, mm -hmm. mentally, yeah. emotionally, spiritually, yeah. when you're going through life, because you can create opportunities for you to feel that. Mm -hmm. um and yeah. once you start to open up to be able to receive that understanding like <laughs> oof yeah that's huge yeah it is dallas this this has been such an amazing conversation you've dropped so much knowledge on us um if people want to keep up with you how could they best do that well i'm on every social media outlet <laughs> there you could imagine um, and it's all Dr. Dallas Bragg, Dr. Dallas Bragg, um, TikTok, Instagram, X, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Um, also have a podcast of my own called The Aftermath. It just started that last month. Um, so we're focusing a lot on you know issues around uh, crystal meth and uh, gay men. So there's a lot of if you're triggered by a lot of talk about sex and using and, you know, those kind of things. That's pretty much all we talk about, but it's in a way of, of, of helping men relate. And I, I've, I've just been so pleased by the response so far from men all around the world coming out and saying no other podcast is saying this. And I needed somebody to say it, <laughs> you know, it's because so many men are living in shame around it. Um, there are a lot of gay meth addicts that attend AA because they don't want to, they already have shame around being gay. They have shame around being an addict, and then they have a lot of shame around being addicted to crystal meth. Such a bad, you know, such a stigma. Mm -hmm. um, they just would rather say they're an alcoholic, um, <laughs> and so it's a it's giving a, a voice to a lot of men. And um, so you can find me in all those places, and then the podcast has a YouTube page too. So oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Dallas, I know, I know we're going to bring you back because there's so much more that we can go into and <laughs> yeah. so, so much deeper. And I can tell that you and I have very similar beliefs. And so being able to talk and honestly, from my own selfish standpoint, like getting my perspectives shifted, right. And yeah. viewpoints yeah. opened, it's, it's yeah. absolutely massive. So yeah. I want to, I want to thank you for thank you. coming on and having this conversation. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. It was different for me to be able to talk about this instead of, you know, just focusing on my, my story. Um, these are, these are subjects that I'd like to bring to my podcast too. And um, because they're just so needed, you know, just so, yes. so, so needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially, especially around men in general, we yeah. don't talk about this stuff at all. Right. And then like you were saying with, uh, the shame that you can carry around your identity yeah. is so deep. And I, I understand. And that's something that I don't understand being in your shoes, but I understand the shame that comes with that and just how, how much of a cycle that that can be. And so I really appreciate you opening up the way you did and sharing that wisdom. And this, yeah. thank this you. is amazing. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for you listening, um, share this podcast. I, if you know somebody who would benefit from it, please share this episode with them. I know that there's somebody out there that you know that would really appreciate hearing us talk about these topics that we did today. And 
you know, leave a review. Let me know how I'm doing, whether it's one star, no star, five star, let me know <laughs> how I can improve. And I, I would really appreciate that. So hit that subscribe button and let's try to be better tomorrow than we were today. Cause if we don't make it, we tried. Mm -hmm. Love you everybody. Have a great week.